Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this week's uh, Research Innovation Conference. We have a not quite native, but close as you can get native Colorado with us, uh, Dr. Tracy Lyons. She did her undergrad at Boulder and then her post or her PhD here on campus, followed by a fellowship on campus. She is one of our outstanding scholars, as well as um, was welcome. the rising star in the department. Uh, she is currently an associate professor in oncology. Okay, she's going to talk to us today about how to start your own lab. Thank you. I think I kind of self volunteered myself for this. I don't know if early career scholar, not thinking it would ever come to fruition. <laughs> Like, wait, am I actually qualified to do this? So I'll tell you what I've learned and see if it's helpful for anyone. Um, and you know, there's so many topics that you can cover. So I, I picked the ones that I thought were most important, um, but it's just certainly not a comprehensive step-by-step -step how to start a lab um, guide. But I'll just start by, by explaining um, my career path. Uh, when I graduated from CU Boulder, in 1999, I took a job here in the Department of Microbiology with David Barton studying poliovirus replication, which was interesting. Um, I learned a ton about um, being a scientist from David and about halfway through, he said, um, you know, you should go to grad school. And I said, well, I said I would be your PRA for like two to three years. And he said, I'm not gonna hold you to that promise. You should go to grad school. So I did. Um, so I, as uh, Mary mentioned, I went to grad school on the old campus and I joined uh, Steve Anderson's lab. First, I was in the BSP program here, uh, which is an umbrella program. After one year, you join uh, a specialized program. I joined the molecular biology program. Like I said, I was in Steve Anderson's lab studying uh, post survival signaling in, in memory development and in breast cancer. I then, and, and I was funded during that time by a DOD pre-doctor board. I then received my PhD in 2006 and did six months in, uh, as a postdoc in, the, the, in my thesis lab. And hopefully I'll remember to return to that topic in a little while on another slide. If I forget, ask me at the end of why this maybe wasn't the best idea. Um, so then uh, after six months in the lab, uh, my, my husband and I made the decision that we were going to stay here. And I was very interested in mammary gland development and how it related to breast cancer. And so I joined the Young Women's Breast Cancer Translational Program here at what was called um, UC Denver. Oh, and you can also see all the name changes. We used to be UCHSD. Now we're, then we were UC Denver. And, uh, here we are, it's not band shoots. But anyway, I was first funded during my postdoc um, by T32. I was then awarded an American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellowship, followed by a Cohen postdoctoral fellowship. And I will just say as an aside, when I decided to stay where I trained, everyone said you'll never get a postdoc fellowship. So not that I recommend staying where you train if you have the capability of moving because it's not the easiest path, but um, it can be done. So after my Coleman postdoc fellowship, I was promoted to research assistant professor within the Young Women's Program. I then received a KL2 award from the CCTSI, as well as an R21 from the NCI, which resulted in my promotion to uh, assistant professor in medical oncology in 2014. I was also told I'd never get an R01 if I stayed where I trained. So in 2016, I received an American Cancer Society Research Scholar Grant, an R01, and then I was, um, after that, I was elected to the Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program. And I will say from a career development perspective, these two programs on campus are amazing. First, the KL2 program, we would meet once a month and just talk about our lives, our science, just, you know, what we were struggling with. And those, if you can get involved in those kinds of things as a junior faculty, it's enormously helpful because you're all struggling through the same things. Um, you're all having fun with the same things and with new adventure in your life. Um, you review each other's grants. You know, I had a brain surgeon reviewing my breast cancer specific aims, and it gives you a really cool perspective about um, what you should be focusing on in your grants. And so, 
After that, um, I was promoted to associate professor in um, 2019, at which time, uh, right around the time the pandemic hit, I received an ACS, American Cancer Society Mission Boost Grant. I was accepted into the Spark Reach program. And these two uh, grant mechanisms are really aimed at commercialization of the technology that you develop in your lab. So the Mission Boost Grant from American Cancer Society wants you to have something in the clinic in two years. And the Spark Reach Grant, again, another fabulous program on campus that helps you to take an idea that you come up with in the lab and commercialize it. And that is what I've spent a lot of my time doing over the past few years. And I could go on and on and on about that, but that's not what today is about. So if you ever want advice, feel free to email me and we can make a copy. Um, and most recently I was awarded a, an NICHD R01, which many people aren't familiar with the National Institute of Child Health and Development, but they do fund studies of normal mammary gland biology aimed at figuring out why some women can lactate and why others cannot. And so very close to my heart with my roots in mammary gland biology. I have also recently co-founded a company that I got to name and I called it their Perla Therapeutics. So here's what I thought I would talk about, starting a research lab. So open the door, turn on the lights, and then what? Just figure it out, basically. <laughs> um, how to find good mentors, how to hire good people, how and when to apply for funding, how to budget, how to mentor, how to publish, and finally, um, just because this has been a big part of my life recently, how to deal with IP and commercialization. So open the door, turn on the lights, figure it out. My situation was a bit unique, so I was already here. So one thing I'm not going to talk a lot about today, which I, I could speak to if, if anyone is interested, is negotiating a startup, buying equipment for your lab, because literally my postdoc mentor moved to Oregon and I inherited her lab and most of the stuff in it. So I didn't have to do all of these big equipment purchases. It, I did not walk into an empty room. I sat at the same desk that I had sat at for seven years as a postdoc and a research assistant professor. So, um, you know, that might be a topic for another one of these conferences. So I knew what was in there, but I didn't really know what I was going to do once I got in there. So it was really kind of a scary thing. And and I knew how to deal with this stuff, but I didn't know how to deal with the rest of it. And part of um, what I think a lot of people don't get trained in grad school or in postdoc about how to manage a lab or manage people. And I think us as young uh, budding faculty, we should change that somehow. And I think that the Department of Medicine here is doing a lot to change that. And I'll talk about some of those programs. But when I looked in the mirror, this is what I saw. I was supposed to do this, but I was still this. And so this, the first thing I had to do was overcome imposter syndrome, which is a really big thing. I was up all night, half the night, thinking, how am I gonna, how am I gonna pay my salary? How am I gonna pay my staff? How am I gonna be successful? I, I, don't, I don't know, like, I just like to do science. So um, some things that, that I really, some tools that I utilized on campus to deal with this was first the CCTSI co-mentor program. If you haven't heard of it, it pairs mentors with mentees. Um, you can do it at any level. There were people in that program who were uh, faculty with their grad students. There were faculty with their postdocs. I was junior faculty with my senior faculty mentor who is uh, Virginia Borges, who was also part of my post-documentary team. It really teaches you how to understand yourself, have um, confidence, and allow mentors to give you confidence, and you to give your mentors confidence. You, you learn about communication skills, how different people communicate with each other, how you may have clashed with your mentor because you didn't understand their communication skill. And so that was um, really important for me to, to sort of do some self-reflection and think about how I was going to mentor either like my, my former mentors or different than my former mentors. And it ended up being a combination. I then um, participated in the Department of Medicine JUMP program. And that, that was in my first year as faculty. And that really, um, again, was helpful because Everybody's there learning about how to do something they really haven't been taught. We just sort of learn it organically. 
A couple of years into my faculty program, I participated in the CCTSI Lights program. And, and these aren't unique to this campus for those of you who are going to be going out starting a faculty job or a research program somewhere else. They have these programs there too. Um, this was the first time that the Lights program had put together junior faculty with senior faculty. So previously it had been all senior faculty. You get together, you put together a, a team science project, with nothing to do with what you do, for example. Um, ours was about how to find collaborations on the internet. Um, and so it was really cool to have, you know, be with a, a, a survey methodologist was on my team. There was a OBGYN on my team. And so just mixing in with lots of different people, I think is really important when you're starting a research lab, just to learn about all the different things that are around you. And I hope what's already emerging in my talk is mentors, 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 because that for me has been the best thing that I that has really gotten me to where I am today. So um, find good mentors. So I had um, Department of Medicine requires you to put together a mentoring team. <clears throat> Mine was kind of big. <laughs> Sometimes there were far too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, but I got a variety, um, I, I made a gender balanced mentoring team, I got a variety of different disciplines, both those who were within what I do and outside of what I do, just to get that sort of outsider opinion. I think it's also really important to find mentors that aren't just going to say, good job, you want them to also be able to say, like, be hypercritical of what you're doing, because um, you, you need that. Also pick people that you like to have fun with. Um, here we are at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference. This is a mixture of my local mentors, um, plus some of my mentors from afar, um, including my, my former postdoc mentor. Um, I call these guys my um, scientific big brothers and sisters uh, because uh, they're a few steps ahead of me in the process. I've known them since I was a grad student and they were enormously helpful. So, you know, reach out to those people that you meet at meetings along the way and, and ask them for advice about what to do. Oh no, okay, hold on. I, is it okay if I get out of the PowerPoint or will that mess everything up? What makes it happen? Okay, I just wanna, uh, okay. Oh yeah, I just need to, that's supposed to be animated, so. <laughs> and I don't have it memorized what's underneath there. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about now is bringing back to the slideshow. <coughs> okay, hiring good people. So again, I said I'm, I'm not really going to talk a lot about negotiating a startup, but one thing that I kind of didn't think about when I was negotiating my startup, um, in fact, I think I went to Ginger and I said, I have a list of all, all of my wants and needs. And she said, that's great. Who's going to do the work? <laughs> so remember to negotiate a startup that includes sufficient salary support for at least one staff member, because at the beginning, it's just going to be you and them. Another thing that um, I didn't include on this slide is um, try to negotiate for a grad student too, because a lot of graduate programs won't allow you to be in their graduate program unless you have committed funds or an R1 or something like that. And you're not always going to have that right away. Um, recent college graduate versus seasoned PRA. I think there are pros and cons to both. My personal approach has been to hire recent college graduates. They're motivated. They often, it's not the end point of their career. They want to do something like go to medical school, go to grad school. And for that, they're gonna need a letter from you. And so they're going to want to do well. Um, the downside of that is my first PRA was with me for about a year and three months before she went to medical school. Um, but she was awesome. She got a first author paper out of it. So, um, and then my second PRA is now a grad student in my lab. So, um, but I have recently hired a more mature PRA 
Um, because I have has grown to the size that I can't deal with all the day-to-day -day, um, needs. I have uh, five PhD students right now, which is a lot. Um, and the so so then the the con of the okay so the pro of the season PRA, particularly if you're in the clinical realm, is that you've got somebody who knows what they're doing. They you don't have to spend a lot of time teaching them. I'm not in the clinical realm. Um, I'm in the basic translational realm. And the con for me was throughout grad school and postdoc, I had witnessed in other labs that a seasoned PRA comes in with their own biases, their own methodology, and they'll often say, but that's not how I did it in my old lab. And, and you as a new PI, you want them to do things the way you want them to do. So, so that's what I've also found to be beneficial of hiring someone new. The other con to a recent college graduate is they're often really green, but they're most of the time quite eager to learn. Um, interviewing. I always find interviewing a very interesting thing, um, but you really, really want to get to know them as a person. You're going to work hand in hand with this person probably for at least the first year of your lab, and so you should like them. Um, I actually hired my second PRA, he's now a, a student in my lab, kind of on the spot. I basically said at the end of the interview, I don't have a poker face. As long as your references don't say anything bad, I'm going to offer you the job. He's been with me since 2016. So, um, you know, just like go with your gut sometimes. If you don't get a good feeling about someone, then that's probably not a good fit. But there also has to be a balance. So someone might look really good on paper and you don't get along with them at all in the interview, or someone might look, not look that good on paper and then you meet them and you're like, this is the person I want. So I think it's important to, I'm gonna come back to this later. Um, it's important to not be afraid to hire somebody and not to hire somebody who just because of their resume. It needs to be a good fit personally. And when to think about a postdoc. Um, this was a, a bit based on my own experience. Um, I was one of the first postdocs to come out of the lab where I postdoc. And so it was, it was an interesting negotiation with my mentor where we had to figure out what I could take with and what I couldn't take with. And, and when you're a junior faculty, it's hard to let somebody take something with because it might be um, too soon. So I have yet to hire a postdoc, so I have no real advice on that. Um, but I also want to wanted to say, I'm going to go forward one. Oops, well, there actually is a huge shortage of postdocs right now. There was an article published in August of 2022 showing that um, people are it's taking years to hire a postdoc. So don't get to your mindset that you're going to get a postdoc within a few months. Just go ahead and hire a PRA. <laughs> I know that's not what they're called now, but I can't. I can't lose it. Um, I also wanted to point you towards this uh, article about how to grow a healthy lab. I think one of the most important things to keep in mind when you're starting a lab is 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 the, the health of the lab, and that means like the people in it, because they have to get along, they have to love their job, they have to um, love their boss. And so some of the things that I got out of this um, is, and, and you can read these in this article from, from May 2018, is to make lab health a priority. One of the suggestions from the PI was actually to designate a person who's in charge of lab health within the lab. Um, the other suggestion in this article was that universities should offer training for PIs. And I think that we're getting a lot better at that. I think it's extremely important to show your lab that you care. Um, I think sometimes I care too much, <laughs> but um, you know, it's important to walk in. Hi, how are you doing today? Not just, hey, where's that data? Um, you know, when you have meetings with people, ask them, what's going on? What's new? If something seems off, chances are something is going on in someone's personal life. Ask them if they want to share or if something's going on that you should know about. Um, 
offer them additional mentors that they can go to. This applies to research assistants, grad students. Um, if, if they're not getting what they need from you, they need to talk to somebody else. It's also important to be very explicit about your expectations. I didn't do so well at this in the beginning, and then I um, realized that I haven't been firm enough about hours, expectations, things like that, um, which everyone will tell you I'm very blase fair about anyway, but, but it's important to let people know what they are. Um, and then every year at our annual review, I ask my lab members to tell me what is and is not working for them. So everyone has to come into their review with three things that they feel they did well in the past year, three things they didn't do well in the past year, and they have to do the same for me. And they ha it's mandatory. They can't just say, you're doing great, Tracy. They have to come up with something. Most of the time it is, um, you need to be less scattered about what you're asking me to do. <laughs> because they come up with ideas. And then I send a text message and they're like, but wait, is that more important than the idea in the text message you sent me yesterday or not? <laughs> so they keep me organized. We do to-do lists um, and things like that. Um, if, if your lab becomes unhealthy, utilize your resources to resolve conflicts. And I found the Ombuds office to be tremendously helpful. Um, I've been fortunate not to have very many conflict, conflicts in the lab, but they do arise. And um, in both instances, we were able to come to uh, a mutual ground through the Ombuds <coughs> office. So utilize that. So when to apply for funding. I think a lot of people make the mistake in some ways of, of sort of sitting back on their startup and not really applying for funding. I personally think you should apply early and often. And you can start with uh, foundations. They're, they often have specific programs for new investigators or early stage investigators that are aimed at developing um, your career. There are lots of pilot grants, local and national, that are also specific for both junior and, and senior uh, investigators. And then, um, of course, federal funding is sort of the ultimate goal. And when you're applying for these, I and, and these were the, the sources of funding that I've had over the years um, since I've been junior faculty. As I mentioned, the KL2 program from the CCTSI, they have several pilot grants. Cancer League has pilot grants every year. So does Golfers, um, American Cancer Society, and, and of course, the National Cancer Institute. And, and one of the things that I think you don't realize when you start is that this takes a while. <laughs> um, so you start developing that R01, start workshopping it with people. Um, and oh, that's when I'm going way back to my first slide. The six months of the postdoc in my PhD lab really worked against me because you only have 10 years for your early stage investigator status. And so I lost that six months. I ended up applying for an extension because I had a child when I was a postdoc. And so there are certain circumstances that they will give you an extension. So I actually got that six months back. Um, and I got, I got my first R1 within that six month extension. So, um, Something to consider, but most of you are probably beyond the grad student um, years. So just something to think about and to tell your future lab members. So also CCTSI has three programs with mock study sections. So if you're going to do a K award, they will do a, what's called pre-K. You actually submit your entire grant and you get a mock study section. Uh, and by the way, I've done all of these. So, and my pre, my K award that went through pre K got awarded. My R that went through K to R got awarded. And um, I've had two students go through the F series fellowship awards, and they both have F awards. So these programs work, and they're sometimes a bit cringy because you're sitting in that chair, and there are two people over there saying hypercritical things about your grant. Um, in fact, for my R, I specifically picked the two people in the cancer biology program who I thought were the harshest. 
and <laughs> they were harsh. <laughs> I remember the leader of the study section as I was walking out said, wow, you handled that well. And I said, well, you know, better now than when I get that summary statement back. And when you get those grants, celebrate because it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> So um, anytime we, you know, we get a good score on a grant, we get a grant, we go out and we celebrate because you never know when it's going to happen again. Um, I don't have a lot to say about budgeting and financing, except just hope that you have a good administrator <laughs> to keep track of, of your budget and, and meet them regularly to go over it. Uh, I, I made that mistake early on when the Department of Medicine started the um, research intensive faculty in, incentive program. I didn't have enough of my salary on the right grants to qualify and so I missed out on almost a whole year of that. And it's because I was just, it's kind of like my bank statement. I get my finances and I'm like, do I really want to look? <laughs> but you have to look. Um, but also don't go over or under your budget. You've got to spend money to get more money. I think those experiments. So we started off small. It was first me and Sarah Black, who's now an MD somewhere else in the universe. I couldn't find her picture. Um, but this was my core group of people um, in 2016. I graduated three of them. We, we grew and we've grown even more. And so as you grow, as I was saying, and this is us all fancy for the American Cancer Society Gala two weeks ago. Um, as you grow, then you need to start thinking about what, what, your need, what needs are different. And so um, I have a couple of more senior PRAs, a junior PRA, and a bunch of grad students. And Kelsey's missing something. So this um, was to introduce the concept of, of mentoring. And um, most mentoring, I consider myself a mentor to most everyone in my lab, but most people think about mentoring in graduate school. So choose graduate programs that are aligned with your interests. I know here we have a lot of graduate programs and that you can join. I only joined two. I joined cancer biology and cell and developmental biology because if you join too many, then you're going to a seminar every other day. If you don't go to the seminar, then the program gets kind of unhappy with you. On the other hand, you don't have access to as many students, so you kind of want to balance it out. Um, as my research is very heavily focused on cancer, those two seem to be the most appropriate. You, you should actively seek lecture and seminar opportunities when it's time to go up for um, promotion. You need to have um, a lot of you need to have teaching on your on your CV. But this also increases your visibility both on campus and at other institutions. And don't be afraid, this is kind of like the PRA, don't be afraid to say no or yes. I have had students in my lab who, who wanted to join the lab and I had to just say no, that, that I don't think that we would be a good mentor-mentee pair. And it can be very upsetting to students, but I always say to them, I'm, I promise you, I'm doing this as a favor to you because if we don't work out, then you're going to have to change labs or you may have to leave the program. So um, just try to find that good fit. And it doesn't always work out. Um, but also don't be afraid to say yes. My first graduate student had a background in structural biology and I couldn't draw you the structure of a protein to save my life. And so I was like, oh, how are we even going to communicate? But then she taught me a lot. About. So, so don't be afraid to bring somebody in who might have um, a new skill. And this is something that um, <laughs> I've learned over time and my lab has taught me. Try to strive for only one new student or intern at a time. One, one summer I ended up with three summer students and I thought my whole lab was going to kill me. Um, and one year I took three new grad students. Um, and. And that has worked out well. They're all still in my lab. They're all not listening because they're at the medical oncology uh, holiday party right now. But um, so, but it is a little bit easier on you and the rest of the lab if there's only like one new person coming in. There's also a mentoring guide that is written um, by the chair of our department that I encourage you to check out. So. Publications. 
you want to think about publishing, you know, as soon as you get the lab going. Um, and you can have all these ideas about how things are going to go. And one thing I think is really important to be careful about is not to overlap projects. It ends up creating conflict in the lab. Don't create competing projects, conflict in the lab. Um, but you can't always, this, kind of, this cartoon is about, you can't always determine where it's going to go. So sometimes conflicts and overlap arise unexpectedly. And then, um, so the, uh, that's why it's important to set your authorship practices early and be consistent with them. And there are certain guidelines uh, online that you can find for uh, what, what real, what the standards are, and then how others have adopted those standards. I teach everyone to write up their own work. I have no problem with research assistants getting uh, first author papers out of my lab, but they have to learn to, to write it and put the data together. I think that, and that stems from when I was a PRA, uh, I got I wrote a first author paper at, during that time, and I, it really was helpful for me going forward. Um, have students work together on review articles related to their project of interest. Uh, they tend to learn a lot, and um, they also can, you know, cross-pollinate each other's projects. Um, and in the early stages, it is crucial to publish somewhat quickly, and sometimes you have to, you know, settle for a lower impact journal than, um, than you might want, but it is important to get papers out. And if you can negotiate publications that don't include the your former mentors as authors. This is not always easy, but I remember when I was writing my very first paper, I had one piece of data in there that I had carried over from my postdoc. And I kept writing the paper, I kept writing the paper, I kept writing the paper. And finally, I said, you know, I don't really need this piece of data. So I went to Ginger, who continues to be my colleague, mentor, collaborator, um, and said, if I take that piece of data all out, can I take you off as an author? And she said, I've been waiting months for you to ask me that, but I wanted you to come to your own conclusion. And so maybe not everybody's gonna have that same outcome, but but try to, it's, it is important when you get those grants being reviewed for people to see that you are doing something different. Okay, final topic is, is commercialization. Um, I, the minute I got my own lab, I wanted to develop a novel monoclonal antibody-based therapy uh, for our target of interest. And so one of the very first meetings I had was with uh, the um, CU, what's now called CU Innovations. Um, that was in 2014. It's now coming to fruition many, many years later. But, but get that notice of invention in there because then you can you can keep thinking about it and you've got the ball rolling if you do need to develop a patent or some intellectual property. Um, consider applying, if you have an idea, consider applying for grant mechanisms that are specific for new therapies, diagnostics, di devices, depending on what you're doing. And, and if you're really interested in commercialization, I've had tremendous support from the Spark Reach program here on campus. And it's been, you know, really an interesting lab adventure. It's a whole new, I mean, that could be a whole other talk about how to handle tech transfer within a lab. And I have, I've definitely made mistakes um, and done other things well. It's, it's a little hard to, we start a company and it's a little hard to keep lab and company separate, but again, that's a whole other topic. So what would I do again? I would continue to hire recent um, college grads who are eager to learn from me and can take direction well, but cap are capable of independent thinking. I continue to ask for feedback regarding my leadership style. I allow and encourage students and staff to make mistakes as long as they own them and maybe don't make them more than twice. <laughs> um, but also allow your students to be successful and own it. Uh, if they do something, it's really important to encourage them that that was theirs. They didn't just do what you told them to do. Like they brought something to it because when people have ownership over what they're doing, they tend to do it better. And that's also speaks to allowing people to, you know, publish their papers. 
um, provide consistent feedback in the format of regular meetings. I have two lab meetings a week and I meet with everybody one on one most weeks. Although if they ask you, they would tell you that I can't a lot. <laughs> That's because I'm getting busier and busier every day. So um, what would I do more differently or do differently? I would be more organized. We're go having to go back now. So now that I've graduated three students, we're having to go back and like, well, where did Sarah put that antibody? Um, and so one of the one of the newer research assistants that I've hired um, is doing a lot of organization, inventorying, figuring out where things are. And that is where it is kind of important to find somebody who you might have in the lab for a long, longer period of time than a grad student. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it might be stricter and or firmer about expectations. Um, it can be easy to be laid back, which I, by nature, I'm very laid back. I don't like to micromanage people, um, but sometimes that can lead to people wanting to take advantage of you. So you have to find the balance there. And so, so what's next? Now you've got your lab, you're publishing, students are graduating. I think the next steps, at least for me, I, I'd like to lead a, a team of investigators, expand on my national and international reputation. I think that's really important to go to the next step. I'm, I guess I'm mid-career faculty now, although I still feel like that scared student in the second fly. Um, I want to experience some more. I think it's important at this stage in your career to experience additional leadership training opportunities that are on campus. And I've now started to mentor junior faculty. So um, hopefully I'm somewhat qualified to do that. So with that, I think I'll take questions, comments. And this is the first time I've given this lecture. So anybody who wants to give me feedback, I would take. Thanks. Good question online. Um, it says, can you give an idea of how often regularly is for meeting with your finance administration? <laughs> once a month. I, I meet once a month um, with them. And um, and then and sometimes more than once a month if something if there's a problem or um, you get a new grant and you need to move people's salary around. Um, I I have a very complicated tracker because I have a lot of speed types. <laughs> I don't, I've never seen anyone else's tracker, but um, my finance administrator within the division tells me that she loves my tracker because it's so complicated. She learns a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Here's another question online. Um, how do you navigate local universities' politics while starting a new lab? Um, I'm assuming that means starting a lab where you trained, which is what I did. Um, but if, if they want to chat, send something else in the chat. So I'll speak to that. That that goes kind of back to the whole imposter syndrome thing. Getting people who have known you since you were 22 years old as a grad student um, to I was very intimidated about whether people would take me seriously as a faculty. Um, and I think it's just important to, to navigate those relationships in a new way and figure out how to make people your colleagues. And I think it's also really important if you are going to stay where you trained to try to not um, make any enemies along the way. I think that speaks to the question. Um, but yeah, local, any university politics are always going to be difficult and an issue. And, I, you know, go to your mentors. <laughs> they often have chances are they've experienced some things in work before. And my other question if you rewind back to like the timeline, I was curious about your DOD. Um, <laughs> And did you have to like work for DOD afterwards or no? It, DOD doesn't have pre-doc awards anymore. Um, 
Um, they now do, uh, I don't even know if they have a postdoc award anymore. No, so way back in the 90s, they developed a research program within the DOD. They first funded breast and prostate only, and they now fund a wide variety of diseases. It's, um, but it is not any sort of service commitment. So a couple more questions online. Did you want to go ahead? Um, it says you talk about including a sufficient amount to hire one staff in the startup package. Do you have any idea how much a hire a college graduate or PRA would be? I don't know whether you asked me six months ago. <laughs> it just changed it all. Um, so uh, when I hired my, my first PRA, again, this was a while ago. Was thirty-four thousand dollars a year, and it's way more than that now. I think um, my junior PRA is at forty-four, and then you have to factor in um, benefits, which are then another thirty per thirty. It's thirty-seven. 32, thirty-seven. So you can pay that on top, and that's something that not a lot of people realize is that a PRA. It sounds like it will cost you forty four thousand dollars, but it's going to cost you more. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious about when you were getting your first grant. If you had any problems, like did you have any reviewer feedback that you were having trouble just dis distinguishing yourself from your mentors, like concerns with independence? Because I've talked to a lot of junior faculty over the years that really have trouble, like if they don't have enough independent publications mm -hmm. or first or, la or last author publications, that they just have trouble getting their first grant. Did you yeah, so that? I was very careful. So first, starting with the K Award, um, it, it's really important, <coughs> because that's still a mentor <coughs> award, but it's really important for the mentor to write in their letter, I'm not going to compete with this person. This is their own thing. Um, and I think for then for my subsequent non-mentored awards, I. I almost always had them in as a collaborator with with a, another another very clear statement that this is my lab's project. This they they are not pursuing this area of research, but maybe they will provide some sort of reagent that um, or like for me it was always one of the things I did as a postdoc was created uh, helped to create a cohort of, of patient samples and patient clinical data. And so that's kind of how I wove in that my mentors supported me. They would allow me access to the cohort that I helped them create, but that they were not going to pursue the same research ideas. Um, and then again, I think getting that first publication to, put, to not have your mentors on it, if you can, is helpful. I can address that from a reviewer point of view. The NIH in, in particular, they actually are downplaying that whole independence thing. Okay. Um, it's really more, can this project be done by this individual? Um, and because they re we're recognizing more and more that team size is really important. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I also think that the, at least from the study sections that I've been on, the Stay where you trained is not as much of a negative as it used to be. And, um, you know, I definitely tell junior faculty that we're the people who can change that. It's not always realistic to move if you have a family or, um, or if you just like being in Colorado. <laughs> Let's be honest. Online has a question. It says, oh, sorry. Thank you. How do you approach determining your long-term vision for your lab, larger, smaller, et cetera? I don't think I would want to get a whole lot bigger than I am right now with, um, the, you know, I, I think less than 10 people is definitely ideal. Um, I guess for me, it's always been dictated by funding, but lately I've been thinking, is this too much for me to navigate all of these different projects? And so I think I, I think if the lab were to get any bigger, I would need to hire some more senior people like postdocs because I can't, uh, 
it's too hard to run every single project on your own. Um, having a good lab, lab manager, I think, really is helpful. Have you found any success in any techniques for power dynamics? So now that you are the head honcho, so to speak, and trying to create and foster an inclusive environment, but knowing that they may be in a position that they can't be too really truthful because you could fire them. Have you found any sort of ability to, or technique to sort of foster that relationship? Yeah, so I, I, I think the first thing I'll say is um, I always, whenever I hire anyone, the first thing I tell them is if you make a mistake or you do something wrong and you tell me the truth about it, you're never going to be in trouble or you're not going to be fired. If you make a mistake and you cover it up and you don't tell me the truth about it, then I want you to consider the implications for breast cancer patient number 35 who doesn't get the right treatment because you fudged an experiment and fudged the data and we followed that data and we did something that wasn't as helpful as it should be. And so I try to make people just really accountable to themselves. Um, and since you brought up power dynamics, I also try to make it very clear to the lab that we that they're all equals. Um, I actually made the mistake myself when I was in grad school of going to one of the PRAs and saying, like, I was just eager, right? And saying, I need this and, and, and can I have it tomorrow? And the next day I was in my PI's office and he was telling me, the PRAs are not your slaves. <laughs> they're here to help you, but they are mostly here to do work for the PI. And grad students should, you know, do their own work. But again, um, I think it's important to, to, to treat everyone equally. Um, I always tell them, don't, don't make me be the boss. And um, yeah, does that help? <laughs> I feel like it's a gray area. That it is. There's no great answer, but yeah. it's just nice to hear everybody's different perspectives and what works for them. Yeah. Yeah, it is definitely one of the hard parts of the job. Some more questions for you online. Um, it says, uh, I just started a lab and I'm thinking about hiring either a PRA or a postdoc. It seems that the cost is similar. There's no big salary difference between the two. Am I right about this? If so, um, might it make it more sense to hire a postdoc if you can, because you get a much better trained person for a small cost increase? So I did not take that approach. <laughs> um, and I don't regret it. I think, and I've seen other people hire postdocs uh, right away and have it work out. And I've seen others have it not work out. And it's true it's a slightly different cost. And there's also an extra added benefit is that they could get a fellowship and then they, there is no cost. So that would be one pro to going ahead with a postdoc. I would just, I, I know that a lot of people have been hiring postdocs, at least that I know, and like losing them to industry a year later because they realize that they are so, you know, monetarily, they're still like poor. <laughs> And um, and so so that's unfortunate, and that would be very unfortunate for a new lab. It wouldn't be so much of a deal for an established lab, but I would just um, want to really understand the postdoc's intentions. Uh, what what they I mean, and not everybody knows, right? It changes, but um, and with you know that said, they might not be truthful about their intentions either. So. So I think it, the getting to understand what that what the goals of that postdoc are would be an important thing to know. Um, another question says, thank you for setting an example of a researcher's journey. Would appreciate your insights regarding the relationship and timing between funding and hiring lab staff. Again, I think you need to hire 
someone right away. Um, I was actually really fortunate that I had um, I had had a summer intern when I was a research assistant professor at the Cancer Center, and she graduated college, and she called me and said, will you be in reference when applying for jobs? And I said, sure, but I'll hire you. <laughs> and because she was a great summer student, so I, I hired someone, uh, you know, within weeks of, of getting getting my my startup package and, and getting my lab. I was, um, and then I think going forward, you need to hire a sufficient number of people. For example, when you get an R01 to to accomplish that R01, but not so many that you eat up the whole thing with salary support. Uh, so. I, I think start small and, and let the funding grow your staff. Yeah. As a, excuse me, as a postdoc feeling a little suffocated in terms of the transition from postdoc to new faculty. So like some of the funding opportunities, we get them all the time. Um, they're for junior faculty. They're not for postdocs. But yet I can't be a junior faculty without money. It's like where maybe broaden my horizons in terms of how to go from the postdoc to the new faculty or to get a new faculty position. I mean, I'm thinking K, okay, but is there another way to do it? Am I missing something? How exactly are you supposed to bridge that? Yeah. So one of the ways um, that I did it, for example, is I was offered before I was a research assistant professor here. I was offered a, a similar position at Duke, and my uh, postdoc mentor here decided to promote me to research assistant professor, which is technically junior faculty, um, and offered that promotion if I would stay. So it's one way of, of doing it. it is, um, I also, after two years of being faculty here, was um, recruited to another university, ultimately decided to stay because um, I love it here and the, the leadership is tremendously supportive of me. Um, but it is a really hard position to be in transitioning from postdoc to junior faculty. There are K awards. And then if you can negotiate with your department division, wherever you are, to get on that research track, then you can apply uh, for other awards. Um, our 21s, surprisingly, you can apply for. Um, and at least back when I did, you could apply for them, even as a postdoc, you could. Um, I think you could even write an R01 as a postdoc, but I'm not 100% sure. No, I think you have to have that faculty position, yeah. But back when I wrote my R21, I was a research assistant professor. I didn't have my K award yet when that was awarded. Um, and then, yeah, the, I don't, I don't know what your field of research is, but I know within the cancer field there are a lot of foundations who, like Coleman, has the Career Catalyst Award, and you can write that as a postdoc, um, and then transition to to the junior faculty. And these pilot awards, um, some of them will have like a mentor pilot award and then a junior faculty pilot award. And so if you can get one of those, that's kind of one of your first steps towards proving that you can get independent funding, but you just want to make sure that you get it on an independent project because you don't want it to appear as though you're just trying to bring money into your PI's lab that's just going to continue to support their research program. Another question online, where did you post your PRA job to find candidates? CU careers, so your social connections, word of mouth. Um, I've posted them all on CU careers. And I guess some word of mouth, but all of the people I have hired have been through CU careers. Except for my first PRA. <laughs> That's all the questions online. Cool. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Everyone.